Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. And remind everyone online and present that recording is in progress. So Steve can work the minutes out. Would you um, call the roll, please, Diane? Captain Ward? Here. Mr. Long? Present. Mr. Mackey? Present. Here. Mr. Mailer? Here. Mr. Robbins? Here. Did Mr. you do that? You? That was you. I thought it was mine. <laughs> Mr. Thompson. Here, by Okay, I guess you're good to go. Yes, you have a right. form. Thank you. I'd like to have everyone stand for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Paul, would you like to? Do the safety minute. I sure would, Commissioner. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see everyone. September's National Preparedness Month. I've been doing a few things here in my office to keep us prepared here at the floor, like updating our coup plan and contact lists and such. But uh, as beauty employees, we're we're expected to to be prepared uh, to stand up. In the event of, a, of an incident down here and you know so th that's what our topic is going to be on muni wide next month as well as fire prevention that always creeps up on us in, in october but i left if if you haven't had a, a plan or a kit the uh, state of alaska gives you a really good strategy on how to develop a, a survival kit uh, a lot of people can't assemble all these things in one shopping spree at Costco, they can't afford it. So it gives you like a 28 week strategy on how to do that. So I'll leave that with everyone here. Uh, one of the things that, one of my shortfalls on the November 30th, 2018 earthquake is I didn't have enough batteries at home. I mean, that was, so it was a lesson learned. It's those little things like that, you know, that, that creep up on us. And lastly, I just wanted to brief. Um, I completed our fuel transfer operations manual that was required by the Coast Guard. It's, it was a pretty big endeavor. It was a lot of work and uh, the Coast Guard reviewed it uh, and signed off on it. So I'll leave these here in case if you want to see them out on the table up there. Questions, comments? Sir. So I just, I just have to tell you that um, I was taking my kids down to the peninsula the other day and I was thinking about your safety minute last month about hydroplaning. Oh, okay. And my son is driving and my daughter is driving now. And I said, so when does hydroplaning start, you guys? And it was, uh, it was a great teachable moment for me with my kids because I seem so smart. <laughs> so I just wanted to, <laughs> as, as you started sideways down. <laughs> I'm never going to complain about the safety minute. I really, so I, I just want to say I appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Megs. I, I like that. I appreciate the feedback. Take care. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Now, item four, the approval of the agenda. In that we have um, a couple of the port users here to do a presentation. I make a motion at our invitation just a second we're gonna i am proposing that we move new business which is not listed on this agenda but the new business will be uh, 15 minutes afforded to each of tote and madsen a little presentation to the commission so i think it would make sense to move that actually right after the board director's comments, if, 
if that's uh, what do you think about that? So moved. I'll second that. Yeah. Any opposed? Negative. Okay, so we're going to move new business to. And then we'll go to the informational items. And of course, public comments item 10. Obviously, after the presentations from Tote and Madsen, there'll be a, a certain amount of time for commissioners to ask questions from each uh, of each of these individuals. And then if questions are raised during that, that, that require uh, Ross to address, we can discuss that in old business. And anything that gets left by the wayside, uh, others can bring up during public comment after that. I'm going to bring public comment behind new business. We're going to push informational items and board director stuff down to the bottom. Um, <laughs> So you can combine your closing comments with your comments, Steve. How's that sound? Fair enough. Okay. And I might move this along. All right. Um, Did you get a motion and a second for all? I had a changes? motion and a second, and no one was opposed to. Uh, but I didn't after the second amendment. So. Okay. So moved. Moved by who? Uh, Mike. Mike. Mike? Okay. And seconded by Garrett or Paul. No. And that leaves us with the approval of the meeting minutes from August 10th, 2020. I'd accept the motion to approve that. Mr. Chair, before you go any further, can I can I ask, would you like this ch these changes just for this meeting or permanent? I think for this meeting right now, just because we have presenters, okay. as, as it was brought up to me, and certainly in the past, I know that if someone's coming here, to present, they don't really need to hear all the other things that we're going to do, they, you know. But maybe next time we'll look at the agenda and, and update some things. Right now, I would say it's fine. With stories. the normal format, except that we have uh, guests today, they're going to speak. So fair enough. Uh, meeting minutes from August 10th. Any uh, accept the motion? Make a motion. Let's Second. Approve. Motion and seconded. All uh, any opposed? Hearing none. Good job, Steve. I couldn't even find a typo. Well, I actually have, I actually have some changes that have to get made because there's things missing from this that I thought were were in them. Missing from the guest list, as Mr. Ruder pointed out, ah, is yeah. the entire Almar crew. Okay. Uh, that was here last week. It was you know Tom in the room mm -hmm. and uh, Luke and Brittany online. Uh, and they're not here at all. So I would like to ask you if you would amend your motion to let me make those changes uh, to the to the minutes so we can uh, reflect then, their participation. Absolutely. Okay. Any opposed? No. Nope. Nope. All right. So move. <laughs> Have you guys flipped the coin back there, Vic and uh, Alex, to see who goes first? Because you're next. <laughs> I think Alex will first. <laughs> <laughs> you, wrote, you wrote the first letter. So in preamble, let me just say for everybody on the commission and those at home, uh, so submitted a letter to the commission. It goes into our packet as correspondence and based on the letter, uh, we've afforded them time to state their case and subsequently Madsen has also written a letter and they're allowed equal time. It's been brought to my attention actually we talked about this last meeting somewhat but we can't restrict it to just Toad and Madsen. Obviously there's other users so other users would certainly be welcome to make statements during public comment, or I believe that next meeting we will also include a portion of it of time available for uh, other users to state. That's a great idea. Make a presentation. That's a great idea. Yes. We're all on the same page. Because we're all yeah. trying to move towards a tariff um, decision and we can do with all the information we can get. That's the way I see it. So did you have a, did you make a decision over there? Yeah. Okay. 
Well, then you have the floor, whoever's next, whoever's going to go. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, is it here okay? Sure. Go ahead. Can you see uh, Vic on the no. online? Can I right, yes. Yeah, yeah, lower so. left hand corner. Right. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity. My name is uh, Vic Angoko. I'm the uh, senior vice president for Matson's Alaska division. And uh, thanks for the opportunity for me to come and speak in, uh, in support uh, of the uniform tariff. As uh, the commission, as Chairman uh, mentioned, we have submitted a letter, so I'm not going to go over the letter itself. I think you all, you all have read it, and you can all uh, read it and, and understand our position. But what I what I thought I would do is uh, I would talk from the experience that I had personally uh, coming from Hawaii, and I was part of the Hawaii Modernization Program that continues to today which was started back in 2008. It was approved in 2008, but in 2005, so if you allow me to give you a little history, then I'll bring it back to Alaska. In 2005, uh, Hawaii Harbor users, we each have our own issues with space, facilities uh, in, in the Hawaii ports. And in Hawaii, it's run by the State Department of Transportation. And at that time, freight was booming. It was going to take off, and we all didn't have space. However, as each operator, as each user of the port facility, it did not make sense for us to go to State Department of Transportation and argue individually our needs. So everybody would be trying to fight for BOT's time. We formed what we call the Hawaii Harbor Users Group in 2005, and we work with DOT Harbors Division over the next few years to try and identify the needs of all the harbors in Hawaii on all the on all the islands. It included uh, passenger vessels, it included tugboats, it included fuel, cargo, inter island barge service, and we all came to, uh, together and we prioritized all the projects together with Department of Transportation and Harbors Division on what needed to be done in order to satisfy the needs of the state of Hawaii. The priority was the needs of the state of Hawaii moving forward. And if we did not do anything, and a study was done back then, if we did not do anything or the state of Hawaii did not do anything, the cost to the state of Hawaii would have been $50 billion by 2030 in 2005 dollars if they did nothing to try to accommodate the growth. So things like uh, you go to Kahului, Maui, we have a barge operator that brings fuel. Couldn't get in because the berth isn't deep enough. So you can't use the maximum capacity of the barge. The Inner Island Young Brothers Service, they needed new facilities. We actually have had in Hilo passenger ships intermingle with uh, Young Brothers Freight and Matson Freight. Dangerous situation. So the port built a new facility, built a new gate, separated. Um, our competitor at that time, Horizon Lines, next door to Matson. Matson has a 110 acre facility. They have a 35 acre facility. They were going to outgrow it. So they are now being built. It's no longer Horizon, it's Patia. But they have a brand new 70 acre facility and a berth being built today. That will be actually commissioned in two years. All of these, I just mentioned that all of these projects, $842 million worth at that point in time, is what was projected. That was just an estimate. And that $842 million was to cover, was projected to cover everything that was out there. When it comes time to pay for it, what was determined that was that it was going to be paid through the tariff. The wharfage is what was going to pay for all these modernization upgrades. Because all the monies that the carriers put in, all the users put into harbors is strictly for harbors. So a common tariff was made. Every passenger, every fuel, uh, piece of uh, barrel of fuel, cargo coming through the dock paid a uniform mortgage across the board. 
like here, it's different for passengers, different for fuel, and cargo has its own. But it was spread across the entire harbor users to pay for this, uh, pay for the modernization. And that continues through today. In the very beginning, it was a steep increase. Um, but then it's leveled out, and everything we collect today still goes toward, um, toward the harbor's modernization. In Hawaii, the Department of Transportation provides the basic infrastructure, which is the dock, the facilities. Anything that has cargo on it is the responsibility of the State Department of Transportation in Hawaii. I'll bring that here now, uh, just to bring it, bring it to Alaska. In Hawaii, as part of the modernization, we had old, we had an old facility, old facilities where break bulk used to be the actual use of the docks. And I think in the 50s, 60s, when this was built, you also had this built mainly for break bulk. So we removed a lot of warehouses in Hawaii. It was an opportunity to look at it for the future and how do we, how do we build the new ports for the future of Hawaii. I think it's an opportunity now. I mean, why are we here today? We're here because the filings are corroding right, right from underneath us. It's not a Matson or a carrier or a user uh, that's coming here and, 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 and projecting the change. It's the fact that the piles underneath us are corroding as we speak. So we need to modernize the whole facility. And it's an opportunity for the Port of Alaska, right, for the municipality, to look at the next 75 years. What is it that what is it that that the Port of Alaska wants to accomplish in this new dock? It's an opportunity to address that. Um, it's the economy. You got every, we all got to try to figure out what the economy is going to look like and, and figure out in the next 75 years. Are we going to be ready to handle whatever comes the way of, of Alaska? Um, uh, one of the big things I think is resiliency. Are we going to be resilient? This, you know, I'm 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 only three and a half months into into Alaska, and one of the things that scares me the most is the resiliency. If this dock went down, there is no easy answer on how we're going to support the port of Alaska. There's nothing, as far as I can I can tell, no easy option. So, you know, build it. Build a dock that's going to be um, uh, that can meet the strictest standards of uh, seismic activity. It's a strategic port as well for the military, right? And uh, you look at a, it's an opportunity to look at the dock and uh, and the port and see if how do we become flexible? How do you how do you use the port? How do you build a facility that you can take advantage of any ship that pulls up to this dock? What do we want? What do we want as the port of uh, Alaska and the municipality? And redundancy is big. I, I think that's that's very important. You know, having uh, docks that that anyone can pull up to. If something happened to dock one, dock two is available, so it doesn't disrupt the uh, commerce and movement of goods through here. So I think what is what do we want? What does Alaska want? What do we need over 75 the next 75 years and moving forward? You know, in the end, in the end, it's it's all of us who live here. It's all of us who live here that's going to pay for it. It's going to be in the tariff. It's going to be a surcharge, and we as a, we as a community will will pay for for whatever we put into this terminal uh, or whatever we decide we need for the state of Alaska. So that's where I thought I'd just give you from my view, from the Matson view, and my experience. Uh, and how we look at it as really this is the Port of Alaska. This is the municipality of Anchorage. It's what do we want? What do we need moving forward 75 years? How do we envision that and build the build the terminal to it? Uh, and that's all items. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Vic. Is there any questions for Rick from the commission before you fade away there? Anybody have any direct questions for me? <clears throat> I do. Yes. So in, in Hawaii, when you're re redeveloping that port um, and modernizing it, do you have the two kinds of delivery systems, the roll on, roll off, lift on, lift off too? There, there is. We, we Matson as well have both roll on, roll off and lift on, lift off. 
um, and barges also operate in the same manner. Uh, we also have, uh, or Hawaii has, um, roll on roll off that comes directly out of Japan. But those are mainly autos, automobiles. Uh, not a lot of freight moves roll on roll off into and out of the state of Hawaii as far as vessels are concerned. That's mainly automobiles and that kind of cargo. Thank you. I think I have a question if I could. Yes. Um, it's appreciate the, the history and learning because I think we all learn from other places that have gone through similar things, right? Instead of reinventing the wheel. So that's always helpful. Um, in, in the picture of fairness and paying for the tariff and surcharges, I'm interested, um, and I think it'd be worth, you know, the commission hearing your perspective of that um, from Tote's position. Or Matson, sorry, I'm looking right. Now. Sorry. So from, you know, as far as fairness on how things are, and because that's I really, I mean, we understand the building, why it's necessary, where we're at, but when it comes to the users, I think as a commission, we have to look at, you know, the, the tariffs and the surcharges. So I think it would be worth hearing your perspective um, on that. Yeah. So I think I go back to, I, I go back to what is it that the port of Alaska needs. And if the Port of Alaska needs, if the Port of, so if the port of Alaska is happy with the way it's set now, mm -hmm. and you just want to, and you want to keep the same type of trestle pier and a cargo dock, that's up to the Port of Alaska to decide. If that's the case, then that's what the Port of Alaska wants. However, in the case of how you pay for it, to me, and then, and then, which is why I kind of went back. I went back to the Hawaii experience. It's not on the individual user to uh, individual port user, Matson or Tow, to pay for that part of the. It's an infrastructure. It's a basic. By the Port of Alaska, it's a basic infrastructure provided by the port for the Department of Transportation of Hawaii. In the 842 million, so this is an interest, it's a good question, but I'll give you an example. In the $842 million modernization plan for Hawaii, the only thing Matson will, will get is 35 additional acres. Our competitor will get half a million dollar new tower. The barge operators, we got X amount of millions of dollars, and the passenger guys got X amount of million dollars. In terms of volume, Matson moves two thirds of the cargo volume in the state of Hawaii, but we pay the tariff that was laid across the board for everybody. You know, from a financial sense, it it, it just makes it easier for the State Department of Transportation to be able to say, I'm going to look at all the volume. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm going to pay, and I can forecast this. I can go out and I can get bonds, and I can use that, use this information straight across the board and say, this is what it is. I don't have to say two thirds of it is Matson, so they're going to pay less because we're not even giving them anything other than a terminal that we would have to rebuild ourselves or improve versus our competitor who's going to sit on a half a million dollars and bring one third of the freight. So if we follow that, they should pay more. But that's not the way we looked at it from a State Department of Transportation or a Hawaii. It's for the reason, the reason we're doing it is for the state of Hawaii. The reason we're doing this is for the people of Alaska. So it's going to be paid again by all of us that live here. We're going to pay for it. I have a question. Uh, in Hawaii, you've got the, the crane operation, right? The, mm -hmm. And Roro as well. Do you use a smaller dock for the Roro or less of a dock for? for we use, for us, we uh, Roro is automobile, so we use the same dock in the uh, automobiles across the sh across the way. It's a smaller pier because it's on parking cars. So and they uh, don't come every week. I'm just I'm getting at, at, at the fact that I, I mean, if, if you were to bring in Roro and not do the, the crane operation anymore, 
uh, and we built a smaller dock all the way across because we could build it for less. Would that be a good idea? It's not the norm. So Roro. So industry standard. Industry standard is container, right? You're gonna move more freight, and if you ever, yeah. if you ever, if anybody else ever wanted to come here, yeah. it's container. If you build it specifically for Roro, nobody's going to come. Because if you look at it in the world, there's really not that many cargo Roro operators anymore. I have a question. This is specific. I mean, I have a question. Not, not a whole lot. Mike has a question. Yeah. So, so um, you said there was a so there was a uniform tariff put into place in Hawaii for the. Modernization of that. The point. difference with there is they, is they don't call it a uniform tariff, right? Whatever they it's a warfage. It's a warfage. So you just increase the warfage. And, yeah. So how much of that was passed on to your customers? Everything. Pretty much. It's, it's on the bill of A. It's passed through as a warfare. So you, so you, so it's not, it's not a fee that you paid. It's a fee no. that your customers it's paid. A, it's a fee that the customers pay on your, your bill shippers. Of a. Yep. Not, not. And you, you would assume that they passed 100% of that on to their customers as well? Yeah. Okay. That's the assumption. Okay. That's the assumption when I say. But it's not your business decision, but no. that's your business decision. Our business decision is what I put on the lady, right? Right. Your decision was to pass it on to the okay. shipper. Yeah. Okay. So in essence, you got 35 acres of land, but you didn't really pay anything. You just pass that fee straight on to your customer. Okay. So pass. Because the state. Everybody's going to pay for the modernization. So it's a pass through. Yeah. Yes. But the competitor got a new terminal. Yeah. And everybody's basically putting the warfage onto their bill of lading. Yeah. And it's the same. It's the same. So sure. there is no competitive advantage. Everybody pays the same. Yeah, I can't speak for what other companies. That's what they do on their bill of lading, right? Can it be? Yeah, you don't know. Yeah, what's now? But, no. <laughs> but what you know, we, we all know what everybody's rates are. I mean, you guys check their rates to make sure you're competitive mm -hmm. so here and as well as there, right? I mean, you're not going to let them operate at your advantage. You're being trying to be competitive. So, okay. We'll always stay competitive. Of course. Thank you. Any other questions? So, yeah. I don't know if this is the right. I think I'll ask my other question in our other discussion. Because that's not really his question. Any other? Anything else from commissioners? Okay. Alex? Thanks, Rick. Thank, thank you. Appreciate yeah, thank that. You, yeah. I'm going to stay city. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, they can't see you if you're over there, I don't think. I, I, I'll try places. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the time. I think uh, we'll pull up a, a very brief uh, presenta presentation, just a few slides here. Um, so I'm Alex Hofling, president of Coke Maritime Alaska. I'm joined by Art Dahleen, and Alaska, he's our vice president and Alaska general manager, as well as Joe Macenti, our general counsel. They're both attending virtually. We appreciate the chance to begin the, begin the dialogue with the poor commission. With the time that I have today, I'd like to give a brief overview of TOTE and discuss Alaska's unique transportation needs, give you a sense of the timeline that we understand ourselves to be operating under, and then discuss really the big issue that we're here talking about, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, the two tariff concepts. One is the beneficiary pays, and the other one is the surcharge concept. Then I want to end by talking about a proposed plan for us and talk about next steps. So let me start by saying TOTE is all in and serving Alaska. TOTE is part of the Salt Chuck family of companies. We are a privately owned second generation family run business that has been committed to serving Alaskans for almost 50 years. Between TOTE and the other Salt Chuck companies, we directly employ nearly a thousand people in the state and have $1 billion invested in Alaska. We annually donate over $2 million to nonprofits. And then um, in addition to that, we also donate approximately $2 million in in-kind shipping to nonprofits, including the Food Bank of Alaska. In summary, for almost 50 years, TOTE has been all in and serving Alaskans. And for that, and that commitment remains firmly in place today. We continue to invest in people and assets for today and in the future. 
So if we go to the, if I can go to the next slide. So let's talk about Alaska, uh, why Alaska is unique and why Alaska needs roll on roll off servers. I wanna spend a minute and talk about Alaska shipping needs. Many of Alaska's key industries like oil and gas, mining, tourism, as well as essential services like the military, public transportation and school districts need out of gauge equipment and materials brought to the state. These items cannot fit into a standard, uh, a standard container footprint. In the lower 48, this type of cargo is normally delivered over the road. Here in Alaska, our row row vessels are the most reliable and cost effective solution. Think of row row ships as large floating parking garages that effectively extend the lower 48 road system into Alaska. <laughs> row rows have the ability to carry dry and refrigerated containers as well as an assortment of cars, trucks, RVs, fire trucks, buses, military vehicles, and large industrial equipment. As you can see up in the, uh, the slide here. Without Toach Row Row Service to regularly transport these items every sailing, they would be transported by seasonal barge service or over the road from the lower 48. There would be significantly higher delays in, uh, delays in service and the shipping cost would be significantly higher. This underscores why the reason why the port needs a dedicated railroad terminal. Railroad vessels are in fact not unicorns, as some have said. Railroads are essential to serving the backbone of Alaska's economy. We trust that the port and this commission recognize this fact and will continue to foster and support railroad operations in this port. I want to move on to our understanding of the timeline for decisions on the modernization program. We recently met with the mayor's chief of staff and uh, deputy municipal manager who told us they are not going to propose a tariff for adoption until the design of the new cargo terminals is finalized. As we understand it, the design advisory board isn't voting on final design parameters until December. The administration sequencing makes great sense because until you have a design, you can't project the cost and cost is, of course, a key input into the tariff. We also know from our discussions with the port director and the port currently has sufficient funds to complete the design and permitting work. While we fully while we are fully committed to the modernization project and the need to maintain a sense of urgency because of the corroding pilings. We also believe it's important to recognize that there is still time here to work together collaboratively. That is the municipality, the port, the assembly, port users, and of course the port commission here to get this right so all stakeholders can support it. And as the commission knows well, one of the remaining issues is how to structure a tariff that fairly and equitably supports the construction of two separate and distinct terminals that share a common birthing line one that can support rural operations and one that can support local operations. It is fair to say we all want the tariff to be at the lowest reasonable cost. We also want a tariff structure that does not inadvertently disrupt competitive markets and hurt customers. We have been presented with a suite of projects that have a $1.8 billion price tag. The port will receive some of the money, some of the funding, and the balance will, be, will need to be raised through a tariff structure. When we look at implementing a new tariff structure, we should look at it through the lens of the work that is being considered. The proposed tariff blurs replacement of pilings and expansion work. In other words, there is the work to replace the corroded pilings within the existing footprint in both terminals. Everybody needs this type of work done because of the corroded pilings. And then there is the expansion work that is proposed for Madsen's terminal that will expand by 86% to accommodate 100 gauge cranes. The proposed expansion of Toad's terminal is 11%. Our view is that the cost of the expansion work should be treated separately. In other words, Matson should pay for all of its expansion related costs and Toad should do the same. For example, we know if the port was in good shape and the piles didn't need to be replaced, a user who wanted to increase its dock space by 86% to accommodate 100 gauge cranes would pay for it themselves just like Tote did in 2002 when it paid to have larger over the water footprint to accommodate our new class of vessels, the Orca vessels. The same approach to expansion work should be applied here. 
Why is it important to separate expansion costs? The port does not want to be in the business of putting its hand on the scale of competition. Recall that there are really two different operating models, Tote and Matson, each with different water side and land side costs. Let's go to the next slide. Sure. Tote's water side costs are much higher than Matson's because we have less cargo density within the row row vessels, which lead to higher water side capital and operating expenses in a container ship. Well, that is balanced against our land side requirements being lower than Matson's. And together, you've got healthy competition delivering the best value to the public. And there are other reasons why the port should separate. Are there other reasons the port should separate expansion costs? Yes, that is the approach the majority of ports have taken around the country. We know this because we hired Mercator International, a international transportation consulting firm, to examine this very issue. Mercator looked at a number of ports and port projects in North America including Long Beach, New York, New Jersey, Seattle, Tacoma, Jacksonville, and Honolulu. They found that the beneficiary pays is a standard model. Their funding is consistent with how RORO and LOLO rates are administered in other ports. To take one relevant example, there's a published tariff in Seattle, Tacoma. The RORO rate is $22 per standard unit, $22. The LOLO rate is $125 per standard unit. And that's because, as Mercator put it, the infrastructure required for RORO is less involved and less costly, and therefore calls for a lower tariff. Lastly, some have said that the proposed tariff is just a tax that, can, that cargo carriers will simply pass on to its shippers, so it shouldn't matter to the carrier. This fails to consider each carrier's business model and cost structure. Simply put, there's a limit on the amount of costs that a carrier can pass to its customers and remain competitive. There are competitive pressures in this market, which is good. Finally, we, find our, we currently find ourselves in the zero-sum game where the commission is being asked to pick a winner and a loser on this issue. Now is the time to take a pause, and we appreciate it. And, and for all stakeholders, the administration, the assembly, the port, port users, and this commission to come together and develop an approach that everyone can support. We owe it to our fellow Alaskans to get this right. Alignment would enable port users and the administration to work together to seek more funding, which would benefit all Alaskans. Acting prematurely on a surcharge proposal that is not complete or, or uh, equitable will take the focus away from the work that needs to be done and cause further delay as everyone's attention attention would be directed at the assembly, which will likely send the proposal back to the administration. So more time is needed for all stakeholders to flesh out the range of reasonable alternatives and answer fundamental questions. In closing, TOTAS remains fully committed to serving Alaskans and supporting a fair and equitable modernization plan. We, su we support the commission's decision to delay voting on the surcharge proposal until all the critical information and stakeholders have had an opportunity to engage in further discussions. Thank you. That's, I appreciate the time. And um, if you have any questions, I'm going to grab some water and I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Any, uh, I, have question? Question. I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. So through the water. chair. Through the chair. Yes. You know the rules. I know you. Well, the way else says it to chair thing. That's how it goes. Okay. Yeah. I can Pretty be a I can be official. <laughs> so through the chair, <laughs> I'd like to ask. Um, so so, and then forgive me if I'm asking a question I should know the answer to, sure. but I'm not a port guy, so um, maybe I should have known the answer to this before I ask it, but. Is the current tariff structure different? I mean, do you pay a lower tariff or a higher tariff than Matson? So I'm not, we both have, I understand, we both have PUAs and I don't know Matson's rates. Um, we obviously, we have a PUA. Our PUA actually has the infrastructure that we built separately. So we're paying for this additional infrastructure that Tote built back in 2003 for the Oregon vessels. Um, our fees are probably roughly the same because we today have the we have very very similar footprints down to the sport fund. I would say in Tacoma, I don't know again, I don't know Matt's 
uh, structure. I would I would venture to guess they're very different because our needs are very different. And um, so. Question to the chair. Yes, go ahead. That's um, so we build a dock for two separate uses. Sure. Yeah. Row, row, low, low, right? We've got high gauge cranes at one end of the dock and no cranes at the other end of the dock. The ship takes out the end of the dock where the cranes can operate. But what does what is Metson do at that point? Are you talking about building a separate load on load off facility on Terminal 2? No, I'm talking about building two different docks. One that you can run cranes down, another one that you can't. So what happens when a ship hits the dock and they can't operate cranes anymore? I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what Matson's business continuity plans are with regard to ports. So wouldn't it be our responsibility as you know, to people in the state of Alaska to have a dock that would be functional at either end? Yeah, I mean, I think you need to balance with this building a facility and, hundred, and hundreds of millions of extra dollars that the citizens will bear the cost of. It's got no ROI on it. It's got, it's, there's no use for it. And then, and then we're building a terminal for tote that has at least four trestles, right? Because yeah, we have three. Yeah, we have three trestles. One can be wide enough to accommodate traffic flow. So, but but you have three for uh, ramps, right? Right. And, and exactly. one for traffic. And right. currently, uh, a fifth one that you share with Matson because everybody goes on on and off that one. And I know that the new design would have them separate, so so it wouldn't, wouldn't be necessary. But we're you know we're putting in extra trestles for ramps uh, on that. That. Yeah, our facility, we're adding it. It's in the neighborhood of 11% additional square foot. Most of that is because we're moving out that 140 feet. Right, but then we, under the proposal that you'd like, it would be exclusive to just you. Well, no, I mean, my understanding is we've got, it's going to have a, a we're going to have a shared birthing line. And so you could bring in cruise ships, military ships. There's this document, it's called the Essential Features Document that basically talks about the needs of Batson, the needs of Tote, and then, by the way, the needs of the other users. And it's my understanding that those essential features have been built into the current design. To make sure that we're, you know, it's not just about Tote, it's not just about Matson, it's also about the, the other users. But as far as, like, other users, anybody who wanted to use a crane, which is kind of industry standard, I mean, Roro, there's, there's not a lot of ships, they're not unicorns, for sure. Yeah. But, uh, but if, say, Tote went out of business and another shipper decided to come in alongside Matson, and uh, they, they would most likely be low, low, right? Well, I would, I mean, going back to what I said earlier, there is a need for Alaska to have dedicated roll-on-roll-on -roll -on capability. If you, if you drive today, if you leave here, I would sure. encourage you to drive to our terminal and you'll see uh, you'll see a hundred plus military vehicles that are not going to go on a on a uh, on a load on load off ship. And and uh, tonight we've got uh, more out of gauge cargo loading tonight. That's for the North Slope. So Alaska is going to need because of the heavy industry with mining and these types of heavy industry. It's going to be a roll, -on, roll on roll off carrier. If not, it's going to be seasonal barge. Absolutely. Like um, I, I mean, I. I long short, so I know, I know. Right? Sorry. So, yep. so I get to see the stuff that I mean, right. you guys ship some amazing stuff. Like I mean, put a, a plane on there that was just I'm like, how is that even going to go? Right. right. Like I mean, but but yeah. it does. So, and and there is absolutely a necessity for for Roro, hundred percent. Right. But uh, I think there's a necessity to be able to do whatever we're going to do on both ends of the dock. Sure. That's my, but, no, I appreciate the question. Anybody else have a question for Alex? Uh, to the chair, I have a follow-up sure. question, if I may. Okay. Um, you had mentioned uh, in your response that that ultimately we have to be concerned about the uh, the citizens because they're going to pay for this. Um, so I guess I'll ask you the same question that I asked the guys from Madison, which is, what percentage of this cost do you see passing through to the what any if we if we charge a five dollar tariff or approve a five dollar per ton tariff or however, what percentage of that's going to get passed through to the 
citizens or to your users? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Obviously, the healthy part of this market is there is competition and we are limited to what we can pass on. And a robo carrier, we've got these expensive waterside vessels and the idea of passing on also the land side for the crane infrastructure is it's there are limits to what a carrier can pass through because there are competitive pressures which benefit Alaska. So uh, there, there are limitations. So you, uh, I am just want to make sure I understand. So for, so for, I'm through the chair. I'm sorry. No, no, you're still, you have the floor. <laughs> um, so, so is it, uh, so, so it could be, and I'm not asking you to disclose, but it could be now that based on your, your land side and your, your water side costs, that you're not passing through some costs directly to the shipper now. And that you're, if we add an additional tariff that's even and not somehow adjusted, that you would be forced to absorb some of that? Well, yeah, I mean, I you, think it could it, happen. I don't want you it, to. It, it could happen. And I would say in general business, if you're not adding more value to your customers, you're not going to be able to pass those costs along, just in general in business. Did I answer your question? Question through the chair? Well, for sure. Um, Alex, um, first off, thanks for the presentation. It was really helpful to hear the perspective of the importance of a RORO for the state. I think that was really well done. Um, I have a similar question to, to what I asked Vic, and in, in a fairness question. I mean, you guys are coming here as the professionals, and I'd like to hear what you would propose is fair. I mean, I see what you're, you, you showed us in scope of size. Right. Um, and percentage of, of dock. Um, and to Chris's point, you know, we're looking at this for 75 years, we have to, to look at it as commissioners and what's the right thing to do. As a user, um, I, I just ask you, what what's fair? What do we do? Yeah, I mean, what we've always said was we want our infrastructure requirements to be correlated back to our user fees, which is how, I mean, that's a very standard approach. And um, and we acknowledge, you know, we, you know, we just, the economics of a railroad carrier, our investments are out on the water. And also with, with regard to the cranes, people draw analogies to cranes. Cranes are analogous to us as the ramps and the additional hustlers, which totally maintains the cost of those and the assets of those. So, I mean, it's really a hard stop there to be fair with the distribution of third party funding and correlating our requirements, our, our, our infrastructure requirements to our fee structure. And that maintains the integrity of competition. Because again, there are very different economies with regard to a low low carrier and a low low carrier. We have all of our cost inputs are going to be different, whether it's we use three dugs, they, they don't. I mean, we have the amount of longshore, the amount of uh, uh, fuel burn, everything is different. We wouldn't expect the port fees to all of a sudden be the same. Does that help? It does. It does. Appreciate it. I just want to give you that opportunity. Thank you. You're not off the hook yet. He didn't always use three tugs. That was only recently. Yeah, I mean, from a safety perspective, we have started using three tugs. I couldn't let that go. Safety? Okay, yeah, let's, all right. Um, let me ask you this, Alex, because you, you stated in your, somewhat in your presentation and definitely in your letter to the mayor and to us, that you felt that anything but cost user, cost payer was going to give your competitor an unfair advantage. Um, you mentioned a report earlier in your presentation, and I didn't get to write it down. Essential features document? No, no that was no. there was a Mercator. report that they had Mercator. done. Yeah, Mercator International. So did you bring that for us? I, I, I did not. I can certainly share it. So it's word of mouth. I mean, we're basically not going well. on what you're it's, So I don't, I, I need to see that. Okay. Um, that would help perhaps because right now it would be helpful. You know what I got? I got this HDR, right? And so for you to, to state that you're going to, you're going to have, an, uh, you'll be left in an unfair situation. If it's, if it's a uniform tariff, it flies right in the face of the conclusions of this report, which is in our, uh, archives, right? This is part of the port direct port commissions um, 
materials that we have to go on. So I'd like to hear, you know, how you would justify a uniform tariff being um, giving them an unfair advantage. I don't understand how that, how, how does that work? How would it be unfair well, I think if, if you're both paying the same? Yeah, I mean, if TOTA's subsidizing our competitor for their infrastructure requirements, you've got a road rule carrier that is paying for the far costlier water side, and now we're paying for the far costlier land side, and it's going to be hard to compete in that economic structure. The HDO report does not reference one other port and how they're funded, and it also explicitly states they would artificially raise our rates so they would make, be uh, may remain competitive. I don't remember reading that. They would artificially raise your rates. No. Well, if you're if you're if you're raising the rates of the road road carrier to absorb the cost of a low low carrier, that's essentially what it is. That's exactly what it is. Well, we're not raising anybody's rates. It's right. just a char It's a surcharge on it's your warfare tax because you're 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 getting this the use of <clears throat> the facility. We're not getting the use of the uh, load on load off facility. We couldn't use it. They're different facilities. Could it be modified so that you could use it? We wouldn't want to use it. We've already had, we've already invested in the roll roll on roll off system. Right, but if, as Chris mentioned, which I don't really love to hear anybody say, if a ship hits the dock, <laughs> <laughs> if a tug hits the dock, I've seen it. Happen. Okay. I've seen it happen. <laughs> um, if something were to happen, you know, as someone who used to live in Alaska and uh, still okay. probably has some uh, concern about this, you know. <laughs> Uh, wouldn't it make sense to have a dock that could accommodate all forms of, uh, of cargo? It, like Chris was saying, I mean, I, I see no reason for this dock to not have crane rails the entire yeah. length of it. I mean, if there were no competitive pressures, I can see that. But we're, we're competitors, and there's only so much that we can pass on. And, and I don't think any business is going to want to pass on to their customers costs that do not add value. Well, I understand what you're saying there, but you're also, on the, on the one hand, telling me that Roro is very specialized and specific and we couldn't do without it, which I completely agree with, sure. you know. So um, you can't just say, on the one hand, say that and then say, oh, well, you know, it's unfair. Well, I mean, there are, I mean, we know that there are cargos and we've got, can, you know, we have trailers, they have containers. There are, there are, there are cargos. We share customers and there is competitive pressure, which is healthy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have to acknowledge. To a point, your ships are specialized. There's a lot of things that Madsen can't carry that you can carry. Um, anyway, yeah. I, I guess I've made the point that I would ask the question that I was looking to ask uh, Mike. To the chair, I just one question for both of you, actually. Um, do you guys, I mean, there's been a lot happening the last four years uh, in business. And I know I went to uh, rent a limousine not too long ago. And they charged me a fuel surcharge for the rental of my limousine. Um, do you guys charge fuel surcharges? Did you raise your prices as fuel prices went up? And was that passed on directly to the customer? Yeah, so in our bill of lading, there is a fuel surcharge. And okay. So as fuel moves up or down. You actually adjust the shipping rates accordingly. Do you have something that. in your con because I know you guys set your contract prices out in advance, yeah, right? That just yeah, our our fuel floats. Right. The fuel does float. The fuel okay. does float. Yeah. I would assume it have to, because otherwise it'd kill yeah. you, right? Yeah. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. Well, I I appreciate the time, and um, I do want to say that that for me alignment will be important to get this project done. And however, we want to be collaborative. We want to be constructive. Um, we want to work together on this. Well, I appreciate that. I think we all want sure. what's yeah. best we for the state. Thing. We want something that that we can all that will be good about. Long, have longevity and be useful into the future. So, any other last minute questions before we? Well, according to the agenda, then we would segue into uh, Ross's uh, recap of the PAMP surcharge discussion. And based on what you've just heard, I'm not sure um, if, if Ross, would you like to, to uh, address any of that? And then the commissioners could ask you questions based on what you had to say. <laughs> and if not, we can move on, Ross. That was like a, like a five-part question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, 
I did. Uh, I did send to Steve and Jim uh, a new and improved um, uh, PowerPoint, which is the Court uh, of Alaska Modernization Program repayment of port debt for the PAMP surcharge concept. This. Uh, this one is dated September 28th. It is uh, literally the same as the one that was delivered to you folks on uh, August 10th. It was the last meeting. Yep. Yep. I just made some some uh, formatting, some formatting things that I'll and I'll tell you about. If you have it up there, Jim, go to cover page. The only thing I did on the cover page was I changed the date to uh, September 28th. Yeah, thank you. I changed it on the cover page. One page up, Jim. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, anyway, the cover page was changed. Date was changed to um, uh, September twenty eighth. And then on the next page, Jim. Yeah, there's September twenty eighth. The, the, there's the cost by phase, one point eight billion dollars as it is today. Jim, the next page, please. Um, Policy considerations; those those are those haven't changed. Uh, one one thing I continue to point out is uh, Jacob's estimates of include escalation figures, which include inflation. Okay, so if inflation were to be the same as what they have predicted, then the port cost would cost one hundred billion dollars. But we know that's not going to happen. It's going to be higher or less. Now on the next page. Um, where uh, this rate design accommodates the first section up there, uh, and that is related to the cargo. It's related to the cargo, petroleum, and cement terminals, and that's about 82% of the program. Uh, and number two is 18% of the program. And the next page, Jim. On this page, I split out the debt outstanding there in the top left, where there's 19 million dollars associated with um, the terminal and the other. Um, down in the lower left hand corner, there's a $46 million that was to accommodate prior expenses, and that's covered in the baseline tariff. And so the other $19 million up there, debt outstanding for 2020 Series A, that's the $19 million plus a forecast of $65 million for perhaps 2022 debt or early 2023 debt. Um, and that's where the surcharge, that's what this proposed surcharge is accommodating, is those two numbers there. I split that out. Uh, uh, Ames uh, recommended that last time, so I, I split that out, which was appropriate. So the debt associated with that is the $84 million that would be in the surcharge. The debt that is outstanding, the $46 million down in the lower left-hand corner, that that's already in the baseline tariff that, that accommodates everybody, that benefits everybody. Okay. On the next page, um, this is the only change on the next page, Jim, thank you. Uh, is I added two lines there, 28 and 29, to uh, match what's in the tariff. The tariff goes out to 29, so I said, well, let's just go out and make it the same. And our proposal is uh, those surcharge uh, charges uh, for each of the three different terminals, the Petro, the Cargo, and the Cement. And then on the next page, um, as I, I might remind you, this is the, uh, uh, it, it is difficult to quantify the financial impact of a surcharge on any particular item, uh, such as milk, fuel, lumber, pickup trucks, vehicles. Uh, this is what we came up with uh, for that. We reviewed it at the last meeting. Basically, the impact uh, with the surcharge that we're proposing, the impact on a gallon of gasoline is uh, two cents. Uh, the impact on a barrel of oil is 12 cents. The impact on, uh, uh, let's see what I got here. Well, I'm sorry, the, the, the impact is over there on the right-hand side, on the right-hand column uh, with the surcharges there. So the, on a gallon of milk, it's one cent. A loaf of bread, it's 0.1 cent. A 40-pound bag of cement is approximately two cents. And on a 5,000-pound pickup truck, the impact would be, to the consumer, would be $8.50, assuming that the port users pass that surcharge on to their customers, and then those customers pass it on to the end user that goes the that goes over the retail counter. And that's just the projected surcharge 
for this coming year. Correct. Yeah. The surcharge. Right. The surcharge is outlined on the prior page. Right. For 2023. Also, can I ask a question? Are you okay with questions now, or are you want to wait till the end? I mean, well, let me go through the whole thing. If you could hold that. Okay. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, no, I. The only thing then on page eight. Then on page eight, I just modified the uh, implementation schedule. Page nine is conclusion, and the conclusion reads the same. Um, it, it, the Port of Alaska recovers its costs through user fees. It's a non-regulated enterprise. It's non-regulated utility. It's, it's uh, enterprise fund of the municipality. Infrastructure court infrastructure investment costs of ports are typically recovered using a surcharge method. The surcharge concept of assigning a surcharge to a specific commodity, such as petro, cement, cargo, coming across the dock is the policy recommendation of the municipality. This recommendation is based upon uniform pricing, which is the concept of one price for each user of a particular terminal. The surcharge concept, particularly, particularly the uniform surcharge for cargo terminal users has been vetted and reviewed by the municipality's bond council, municipal advisor, and independent advisors to the port, and is consistent with the municipality's prior practice to support usage pricing across operations. The amount of the surcharge will be reviewed annually, and each year it'll go out one year further. The surcharge concept is a fair, transparent, equitable, and legally defensible concept. The other thing I might add is we we believe that um, and, and encourage the commission here to implement a surcharge based on tonnage or barrels. Now, not wait any longer because this is based on recovery. This surcharge is based on support of required revenue for debt. And there will be more debt. It is. It is inconceivable to assume that we are going to receive $1.8 billion in grants from the state, the federal government, or any other uh, philanthropic group. So we will have debt, and, it, and we encourage the commission to uh, implement this uh, now, and by that I mean effective approximately on or before January, approximately on or about January 1st of 2023. So that's my summary, and I welcome questions. Chris. Chair, so I, I feel like I asked this last time, and I didn't get an answer. And if I didn't ask it, I apologize. I just, I've been thinking about it a lot since the last meeting. So the $1.8 billion is going to cost to build the port currently, right? Assuming inflation and everything else. And I understand your, your numbers down. You'd like to be exact, but I'm just the worst case scenario here, right? If we have to finance the entire $1.8 billion, is the, the current tariff rate going to increase by about 20 times? Because right right now, the, the dollars that you have, the $84 million, you know, times 20, like I'm not quick at math in my head, but I'm thinking about 20 times that, right? Let me, uh, let me, let me do something here, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, Certainly. I've got, an, the, I've got a plan of finance. That's a separate document from this. It's a plan of finance for the port. This document that you have, of course, is the surcharge concept. Okay. Now, the two documents are related, and this is what I used uh, when when I went to the to Juno with the with the mayor, and we do have that. Uh, I, we, I just we do have that. I just want to know no. how much we're going to pass off to the consumer per container, because the average container is you know twenty to twenty five tons, right? What if the full price is passed on? What what are the customers going to pay? And, and and what are we talking about? Like I mean, you know. Okay. Sure, sure. So if we assumed, if we in on this page on this other document I have that I'm using here, if we if we assume that the Miss Pally borrows 1.3 billion dollars, okay. The state of Alaska contribution that we uh, were successful in receiving and very grateful for in the first quarter of the year in the legislative session that just ended was $200 million. $100 million of which is con 
contingent upon receiving $100 million in federal grants, which is a reasonable expectation. So we're going to assume we get that, and that way we get the $200 million from the state. So that, that gets us up to our um, dollar amount that remains, which is uh, about $1.6 billion because we've already spent $200 million. Okay, so that gets you to 1.8. So the tariff right now per ton, based on tonnage across uh, all all commodities, is approximately three dollars and thirty cents. Okay, for right now, for what correct. We're right now, yes, but not yeah, not not at the at the 1.6 billion. No, it's spend. right now today. Okay. Right. Okay. So part of that tariff includes a tariff uh, for the 2020 bonds that were issued. So we would back that out. And then we're going to move it into the surcharge that we're going to use for just debt. The, the new, the new and proposed search, the new and proposed tariff that will be before you, if it isn't, already isn't, will include a separate line for a surcharge, and it will just take care of the debt. So we, so we have to move that out of that baseline tariff a little bit for the 2020 bonds. And then, if, assuming that we need revenue to accommodate 1.3 billion dollars in debt. We'll need to move the cost per ton to twenty seven dollars, twenty seven dollars up ton. from three dollars and thirty cents. So that's a change. Uh, the new cost per ton is twenty seven dollars and thirty nine cents. So the increase is twenty four dollars and nine cents, which is a seven hundred and thirty percent increase over today's current uh, right, but tariff. That's if we have to borrow 1.3 billion right. and we don't receive any additional federal funding or state grants or you're talking about 621 dollars per container about approximately 23 tons and how much is it I, I do it per ton so how much is in a container about 23 tons about 23 tons yes okay depends yeah. right. i think some of some of our 40 footers we have more yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. what was that number uh 621 dollars we per finance day. Everything that's using it 27 39 per ton, right? Yes, sir. So that's the worst case scenario because you haven't allowed for uh the Marriott Sue, we haven't allowed for um certain matching, and we don't know what's right. going to happen and right? future federal but, grant, right? There's words. possible uh other funding to be had, but that's yeah, that, that, and that's a number that we would have loved to have seen last meeting or the first, because uh, I know we talked, we asked this. I'm sure we brought we, that we, up. We're worst talking case scenario. around it. We around, yeah. yeah. yeah what, what's it going to cost? Yeah, what's the worst case? Because he didn't have that. We didn't bring the plan of finance to us. He just brought us the formula of finance, the surcharge I, formula. I, 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 Mr. Chairman, I came here to uh, support the uh, surcharge concept and. Uh, um, yeah, I'm certainly happy to. Um, Can we get a copy of the plan of finance? Yes, sir. Good. Uh, Absolutely. That'd be good. Yeah. PowerPoint. And, and we'll include we'll include various scenarios, including Thank this you. worst case scenario yes. where we finance 1.3 billion dollars. It includes other scenarios where we do receive some federal funds, but this is what we expect would be the worst case scenario, uh, which is we finance everything beyond the grants we've got today. Well, I think the worst case scenario would be it ends up costing 2.4 billion instead of 1.8 billion because you know anytime you involve engineers, uh, <laughs> where the company <laughs> accepted, and we take another 20 years. To yeah, exactly. exactly. Another yeah. 20 years. We build it like tomorrow so we can get the cost right. <laughs> well, and that's one of the reasons that I want to ask you this next question, Ross. You are proposing that we bring the surcharge uh, to a vote sooner rather than later. And I believe that's that you know the design committee has has yet to finalize a design, and so that's one one reason to delay it. Um, but I can say that having been in this situation, building a boat, um, starting the surcharge early allowed us to pay the boat off early. We knew we were going to build the boat. We got to build the port one way or the other. If we can get some of the funding now at these rates, we know the rates probably aren't going to go down the next few years. I mean, I guess I understand why you were proposing that. Um, and you're speaking directly for the mayor when you were asking us to make a decision as soon as possible on the tariff, proposed tariff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the, 
there's a couple things here. Um, the, the surcharge, the surcharge is, re, is to provide required revenue for debt outstanding and to accommodate covenants that we provide to investors. Okay. It does not go into, it does, it is not proceeds that go into building the assets of the port. It is money that is, that will be set aside, segregated just for debt service and other required revenue of the investors that we have that we will have to covenant for example we will have to re, we will have to represent to investors that we have 1.3 times 1.35 times coverage okay now that additional coverage will be in the same bucket that cheryl uh, beckham will be managing with public finance and that money will be separated and segregated. It's not to build assets of the port. It's to support the debt service and accommodate the, the additional required revenue. Now that extra 35%, eventually when that, our proposal is eventually when that hits a critical mass, it will be set aside, whatever's left over after debt service and other items to be paid for, for investors, that money will be set aside in an investment fund that will be a long range investment fund to rebuild the port in 75 years. Um, like perhaps that what they maybe should have done in 1950 when they built this port. And so we wouldn't have this issue. Now we're doing the same thing for the Anchorage regional landfill. For example, we have an obligation in the landfill to cover it and to do post closure uh, requirements for it. We're setting aside and we won't need that money for 60 or 70 years. We're setting aside money for it which is the prudent thing to do. Now, I've invited uh, Bob Owens, the Assistant Municipal Attorney. I've invited uh, Steve Cantor, our Municipal Advisor, and I've invited Cynthia Weed, our Bond Counsel, to help us out with uh, questions here. And, and uh, I would like uh, Bob, if you wouldn't mind, Bob, to address the question about uh, implementing this surcharge now, and then I'm going to ask Steve Cantor to support that idea uh, from an investor and rating agency side, because there's a lot of things that go into this uh, question about when to implement this surcharge. Bob? Well, um, I'm not exactly sure what you wanted me to address, but I do notice that in the conversation, we've had a little bit of disconnect with respect to representations that were made during the meeting with Alex and the chief of staff and, and deputy <coughs> municipal managers um, relating to the time of implementation of the surcharge. And I think it was perhaps an honest mistake, I'm not quite sure, but I, I do know that Alex asked a question about implementation time in connection with design, and he got an affirmative response. That, but I, I have a, an inclination to believe that as we work on this project in a day-to-day -day basis, one of the key things we're dealing with is what is what's the concept? What exactly in the big scheme of things is the, the conceptual design that we're going for? Is it gonna be 85 feet wide, is it going to be 100 feet wide, is it going to be 147 feet out or not? Those sorts of big picture questions still have a few issues to be resolved. And so I think perhaps, I don't, this, it wasn't a topic of conversation, but to the extent that there was discussion about waiting until the design is complete, I read into it that the administration believes that we ought to have a general concept of what we're going to build before we go headlong into things. But we know that the, the detailed design is going to be, take more time. But we're going to have costs. As you said, Mr. Chair, we know we're going to incur these costs. And there's nothing like the present to start putting that money away. And if I may, uh, Bob and Mr. Ward, we know that we're going to have debt uh, to further to further uh, Bob's comment. We know that we're going to have more debt. We just don't know how much, but this is a concept that uh, 
this concept accommodates $84 million in debt. And we, you know, that's that's just flat out going to happen. And if, if it doesn't happen, uh, and, and then there will be more debt, but this surcharge covers only that $84 million. And whether we issue it in December of 20, well, we're not gonna issue it in 2022, maybe the first quarter of 23, if it isn't until the first quarter, the fourth quarter of 23, it's still gonna happen eventually. Now, so we believe we support the idea of implementing the surcharge now. And I'd ask Steve Cantor, our municipal advisor. Could I, could I, before we shift sure. gears, just one more thought. <clears throat> um, I'm no expert on the federal regulatory system and administrative process associated with, with tariffs and surcharges. But I do know that in general, the desire is to be fair and equitable with everybody that you're dealing with. So it's important that you guys are here doing this work and asking these questions, because ultimately, if whatever outcome is, we need to justify it and be able to explain that we, we took the time to listen to people. We, we thought about different alternatives, and our end goal was to be fair to everybody. So I commend you for that. That's, it's really important work that you're doing. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Bob, for helping out there. And if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I might ask Steve Cantor to comment on the uh, the importance of uh, starting a surcharge uh, now. You can yield the floor for support from Steve. Sure, he's been sitting patiently. You see here on you, nobody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, members of the commission. Um, and thank you, Ross. Um, we support the administration's plan to um, implement a surcharge sooner rather than later. We think it's very important to demonstrate to the investors that the administration and the commission are, are able to support a revenue increase because as Ross indicated, um, we're going to have to issue more debt to finance the port. We don't know how much that debt's going to be. It's a function of a variety of variables, including the federal government and state government. But we know that that's going to be a very important um, component of the port's finance commission. And it's very critical to the investor to demonstrate that the municipality and the port have the ability, but also the willingness to raise rates to accommodate the investors. And so um, we've been a very early supporter of implementing the surcharge, um, knowing, of course, that we're going to have to issue debt both soon, but also in the future. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Does Cynthia want to wait? Cynthia, uh, maybe we could ask Cynthia if she has any That's comments. Fine, sure. Cynthia? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you. Um, we and our firm have been bond counsel to the municipality for decades. Uh, and our job in that regard is to uh, provide opinions and advice to the municipality with respect to the issuance of bonds. And in particular, bonds that are going to be backed by the revenues that the utility or the port would generate. And so we have to issue an opinion when bonds are, are going to be issued. Our opinion has to say that the debt is valid, binding and enforceable, and that the revenues that are being uh, assessed and collected are legally uh, able to be assessed and collected. And in that regard, uh, we have been assisting the municipality in examining the alternatives. and. Uh, although there are, um, an, although there may be a number of alternatives, uh, we have, uh, and I have worked with uh, uh, my partners uh, to be able to say that what currently has been proposed is a, a legal method of collecting and uh, collecting charges that can be pledged to pay debt service on bonds. Um, it's not to say that it's the 
only way to go, uh, but it certainly is uh, commonly used and is effectively a legal method of raising revenues to pay the debt service on the bonds. And we have to be prepared to issue that opinion. And where we are right now is we're prepared to issue an opinion with respect to the bonds that are proposed to be issued. Thank you, Cynthia. Steve, raise his hand. Are you going to unmute him, Jim? Um, I think he's going to do it. Yeah. There he is. Uh -oh. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I have no other comments unless there are other questions. Oh, we thought we saw your hand raised. Sorry. Nope. Any other Try questions? to keep my hands below the belt. <laughs> Cynthia. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Ross on this topic? Sorry about this. I guess I threw the chair one question. Okay. Because he said early approval, and and I just wanted okay. to make sure that we were still, we had been discussing it like a January 1st kind of implementation thing. So that's kind of when you talk about early approval, that's what you're still talking about, right? Or are you talking about something further in the future than that or something sooner than that or what is exactly you're talking about? Well, I don't use, uh, Mr. Chair, I don't use the word early. I use you the don't word have what, yeah. <laughs> eminent, perhaps. Eminent. But a page eight is page eight is the, uh, the what I call a surcharge implementation schedule, and, and it really hasn't changed uh, much. It's just uh, a little shorter now because we're further along. But yes, the, I'm I'm suggesting that we uh, propose have it place by the surcharge. Let's we'll we'll make sure. Okay. January first, twenty twenty. Which means that if, if that's going to happen, we would have to have a vote on it either this meeting or the next meeting in order for it to go before the assembly. And there's a specific timeline right, that right. takes place. Right. I got it. Right. Right. So, with okay. that in mind, if there's no more questions, I would uh, like to move to public comments so that Bert or Lev or anybody else from the users that might have something to say about this could weigh in. Great. Are we still Chair, going to look at bringing them in next meeting? Depends on whether or not we have a vote today. I think we I think to have, to have a vote today, we would have had to have it on the agenda already. It's on the agenda for a vote. No, your vote doesn't have to say vote. It just has to be on there as business. That's correct. No. You don't want me to pull Robert's rules on I, I know you could pull whatever you want out. I know Robert's rules. <laughs> so, you're the chairman. You get to this. Well, that's that's what it, the way it works is it's on the agenda. We've discussed it already. Now we've allowed presentations and I would like to. Does any anybody have uh, anybody online or in the room have public comment? Have you signed up for public comment? Would you like to make public comment about this issue before we move on? Um, Mr. Ian Polsky has his hand raised. I okay. I would be disappointed if Lev did not have his hand raised. Lev? Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I appreciate the presentations. I, the concern that comes to mind as I go and I watch the process is when we move away from a user pay model, there is less incentive to have a cost conscious nature. Um, I would also add that as we talk about various contingencies, even if we discount boats hitting docks and other things, we get into a situation of additional cost, additional redundancy, and all of that is going to increase the number that was presented. Because if if someone else is paying for an improvement for your house, there's no incentive to be as cost conscious as you would if as you were paying out of pocket. And would just like to make sure that that is accounted for as we look at the various options. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else Casey would like Sullivan, to? Sullivan. Casey. Yeah, hey, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the commission. Really appreciate you all taking the time to ensure that you're hearing from the users in this space and I think uh, it doesn't happen very often, but I agree with what Lev just said. <laughs> uh, you know, in the space of it all, as far as the user paid model, I will say that you know it is something that has traditionally been where the municipality has focused on, and I, I think that this feels like a little bit of a departure in that instance. Not to say they've always done it, but in this instance, it certainly does feel like a bit of a departure. Regardless of that, 
I do believe it's it's beho it behooves the commission to ensure you're taking the proper time to evaluate uh, both discussions that you've heard here today. Plus, I do I think that uh, Matson had a or not Matson tote had the report that I think they're going to probably provide to you all about what they see across the rest of the nation when it comes to what's the gold standard for these types of situations. And I think that would be very helpful in your deliberations. So, uh, you know, we've been in the in the past, we've always felt like we've been rushed into these tariffs and I would just uh, ask the commission to, uh, you know, do, do what's right, um, uh, make sure you have the right time to deliberate it and make the right decision. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Casey still has his hand up. There you go. Okay. Hearing none. Before we close out this particular piece of business, is there any any uh, commission that would like to make a motion? To I, proceed. I, I would. Um, this is Paul. I believe. Um, we should be consistent and um, not vote today. We have information we're still waiting to get. We have um, have not afforded the other users the opportunity to present to the commission some of their concerns with the tariff, the way they are presented. And maybe there are none, but I feel we they deserve the opportunity, cement and, and petroleum, and just come in and say, so we're all on the same page with that, and then have the vote. We, I'd be okay with following that presentation and the information we're given from cargo that we um, would be well prepared to move forward with Ross's recommendation and looking at that. Second. That's not really a motion. Yeah, I don't know what it was. It was, was. a long motion. <laughs> <laughs> it was a convert. Yeah. So, yeah. Make a more succinct motion. So, okay, motion would be, motion would be to hold on the vote until we've heard from the other users the next meeting. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, please. Hi, Aves. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to speak to uh, Paul's comment. I agree with Paul. I believe we've been presented with some new information that we want to look at. I, I understand and realize the importance of a of a uh, vote soon so that we can reduce the uncertainty that is facing the uh, the uh, part of this bill. But uh, I, I do believe that uh, one more meeting uh, in the reasonably near future would be in order. Thank you. I understand what you're saying. I uh, think we're all pretty much on the same page on that one. Anybody yeah. else on the commission have anything, Chris? Uh, I, I would like to know the current price on both ships. Now we've asked that in the past. Mm -hmm. It's maybe proprietary. It doesn't seem like uh, anybody wants I'm, to tell I mean, us that. I guess I could call and see what it costs. Call and get a quote. Forty foot container. <laughs> Just be a customer. <laughs> yeah, that's we also something that. that could be addressed by the next meeting. You know, the Mercator report was um, requested or contracted by Tote. It wasn't. A report that I mean, I'd like to see it because it was referenced. You can bring it up, so I would like to see it. But it's not the same as the HDR report, which was commissioned by the Port of Alaska or the municipality. So we have to look at it in that light. You, get, you know, there's a lot of a lot of people out there that you can ask for a rec for an information or recommendation and. They're get, they're getting paid to give you what you're looking for in a lot of cases. I'm not just I'm not saying that's what happened, but I'm saying that you know I'd like to see more information than just one report. I've asked several times if we could get some idea either from Toad or Madsen uh, <coughs> what's going on in other ports that they work in. You know, and Vic gave us the Hawaii uh, uh, rundown. Um, Alex alluded to what happens in Tacoma, but it'd be interesting to know, you know, nationwide, what is the norm? And Ross has presented to us that the norm is uniform tariff, right? We have no documentation for that. You know, 
be nice to have something we could hold up and say, this is why we're doing this. This is the same as other ports. Um, I, I agree with there's some other information that could come out. I would like to uh, add that to the next agenda. Uh, other other users options mm -hmm. to come forward. But I think what we're looking at is a, is a reduced timeline because we normally meet every two months. Now we're meeting every month and we're going to be meeting every month until the end of the year. So an extra month is not that big a deal, but we're going to need the information. Otherwise, we're going to be Here again. voting absent it. And Through the chair, can I ask? I want to ask the municipal attorney a question. Sure. Can I? So, uh, Mr. Owens, if the commission was to vote in November at our meeting um, to to for, for a new tariff to start January 1st, uh, can we get on the assembly agenda? I don't know, depending on when, I guess we'd have to look at the assembly schedule, but is it possible to get on the assembly agenda, agenda in December and have that new tariff approved? What's the municipal process? I want to, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if the municipal process fits that or would that need to be pushed back to February 1st or what? what's the amount of time? Well, I'm not familiar. Do you know the assembly agenda sure. schedule? Sure, if I may, uh, Ron, Mr. Ward. Yes, absolutely. It was usually two meetings a month. Right. Okay. And this this would certainly take an introduction and a public hearing, right, Steve? I think it was. Yes, it'll it be would. it'll be introduced at one assembly meeting and come up for public hearing two weeks hence yes, the next assembly. Now, my guess is also at least one work session. Yeah, yes, sir. At sir. least one work yeah. session, probably two. And very and likely. So you're looking at a month and a half minimum. And that could be likely. and that yeah. could be, be even before you introduce. I don't think even if we passed or 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 didn't pass it today, it's going to get you implemented by January yeah. 1. I mean, I just don't think that's realistic. Well, unless you adjust yeah. the time when you have a meeting. No, we voted today and passed it. Well, if you voted today. If we voted today and passed it, I don't see the assembly getting to this, yeah. getting work sessions yeah. to this and getting this done by January 1. They that's did last month. month. Did they? Yeah. I, I, it was I, within I, a month. It's, it's, well, then uh, maybe we could do it again in November. If you voted today, uh, there, there would be a reasonable expectation that the assembly could have work sessions, an introduction, and a public hearing at an assembly meeting and put this in place by January 1st. And there's a reasonable expectation on my part that that could happen. Now, if you, and, and today is September 28th, and if you did that sometime in October, I, I, if you did that sometime in October, Perhaps by the twentieth. Quite a bit closer. You, I, you, I would still have a reasonable expectation. I, I, I think that, if we did it next month, we'd yeah. still. We're, we're this October, that's right? Not November. I keep, I keep thinking this is October already, and we're going to vote in November. But if we waited thirty days or so towards the. Well, let me ask you this: Maybe the municipal attorney is the right guy to ask this. If we were to vote late, let's say, waiting to bring all the information in, and we didn't get a vote until November, can we ask the the assembly to approve it um, to begin January 1st, even if they don't vote on it before, to you know, make it retroactive? Is that legal? Well, I, I don't know. I would, I would think I would discourage it. Okay. And uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, the, the users need time to, you know, they need lead time probably too, a little bit of lead time, although they've known that this surcharge is coming for many months uh if we if you had a meeting sometime in october and made a decision at that time i would have a reasonable expectation that this could all be done by the end of this year Steve, if you have yeah. a meeting in late november um no it's not going to happen steve yeah well a couple of things um, I, i've seen the assembly approve charges retroactive to a, a start date that the decision was being passed. Okay. And I agree with Bob. That's uh that's messy. It is and, sure. uh, and probably should be avoided. Uh, and I, I, I was also going to mention my closing remarks but since we're on the topic of mission now and, and, and Ross is correct in deference to the users if we're going to put a surcharge in place they're going to need time to inform their customers uh, because I'm pretty sure, because I do the same thing, I'm pretty sure that I'm not 
feeding everybody. There's a surcharge coming. There's a surcharge coming. I don't know what it is. There's a surcharge. No. No, until you got a number, you don't open your mouth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not in a real business, but I but I know that much. So this is the third meeting that we've talked about this. Yes, it's obviously been coming. It, it, and three dollars a ton, or but 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 I, but I don't think until you know what that number is, you're going to mention much of anything to your users mm -hmm. or your customers. I and uh, so we've got to allow a certain amount of time for that to take place. And then they, then they got to go back to their accounting offices because everything has got to get prepared and they got to go back and look at what their budgets that got approved. Long before we had this grip, this bright idea to do it. I mean, it's going to have those kinds of effects. So there's going to be, you know, putting a surcharge in place is reasonable and putting it in place uh, in, in a manner that allows it to be executed. <coughs> And you know, in, in the best interest of the, of the port users. I have a question for Steve. Okay, I may get the check. Sure. So, Steve, staff is going to have to implement this surcharge increase, which is not hard for us. Okay, so so you could pull the trigger. So, if we from from uh, raise the tariff to implementation, how long does that take staff? What what? How much time do you need? Well, line item. Yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, it's it's how the computer fills out the invoice. So it's a week, it's a month, it's three months, well, it's what kind of yeah. notice? Are, 30 days. You have we have contracts with the users. Well, I'm we assuming. don't really. No, we have, we have preferential we have user agreements. With obligations to and then we notify fill them. them when they use the port. Okay, so we have obligations to notify them in those contracts. No, no contract. No. You just said it. It's just a user agreement. I just mere verifying. All right. You know, I'm sorry, I'm not as quick. You don't know the stuff you guys know. I'm just making sure I understand. <laughs> Surcharge is coming. It's going to be less than twenty-three dollars a ton. Right. Be significantly less than three twenty-three dollars a ton. Right. And you know, I, I appreciate the the concern of people setting their budgets, but every time you turn around, somebody's hitting you with a surcharge. Raven just decided they're going to charge us for bags on every trip. You know, come on, it's it's not unusual. Now, let me ask you this, Ross. At this magnitude and forever. Before we get off this, is it? What is the imperative to get this done by January first? <laughs> Aside from the fact that it makes sense to start early. Well, as Mr. Cantor pointed out, uh, it makes sense to start early. Uh, it gives everybody comfort on the other side that invests in our bonds. However, I, I, it doesn't, surcharges don't have to take place on the first of every year. So if we miss January 1st, it doesn't have to be January 1st, 24. It could be March 1st, say February 1st, whatever. Month, a subsequent month. Right? You know? It, could, it so, could go so far as be effective X number of months before we know we're going to have to go out and borrow a big lot of money. It can float in some kind of arrangement mm -hmm. and we can, yeah, we're agile enough where we can respond to that. That's, well, let's that's, not that's elude that's ourselves. Too, but this is going to keep going. We're going to have more and more of these uh -huh. as, right. as the project, you know, right. the, the issue with this first one is okay. if we've set a surcharge based on a uniform tariff, then there's a precedent. And, and that's correct. That's the big deal. Yeah. Part of the issue we're having right now. So that's something for everybody to think about for next meeting. And we encourage those who have information to get it to us ahead of time so it can be put in a packet before the meeting, like the letters and, you know, so that we can make an informed decision. I don't uh, see us doing anything else on this. Today. No, unless somebody was going to make a motion to have a vote, and I don't see that happening. So there's a motion on the floor to. There was a motion. Vote on that. There wasn't a motion, was it? I cleaned it up. Motion. He made a motion, yes, he did. and I seconded it. Yeah, yeah. Which was to After you postpone it to the next week. Cleaned it up. Right? Except my motion was too long, so we made a motion. <laughs> we were just discussing. Okay. We were Your motion, motion is to, to have take you. no action. Motion. Motion. motion was to <laughs> invite the other producers to into the next meeting. The other oh, users. That was already. We already discussed well, that. I, we well, officially okay, did so a now motion. It's, now we didn't decide to vote on it. Does the anybody have further that. comment on Paul's motion, seconded by Mike, about having uh, inviting other users to present at the next meeting? No discussion. Any opposed? Hearing none. So moved. So next meeting, we'll make sure that's in the agenda, Jim, that more users will sign up to make a request to make a presentation, which will be 
can, I, can I suggest if they're going to make an extended presentation, they uh, sign up, but if they want to make a comment, we'll just take them on the fly. We want more flexibility. Same well, comments are always welcome in public comments. Right. Same 15 minute rule? 15 minutes, yeah. yes. In, and if they have new business, if they have in new business documentation, they need to bring it to Jim in plenty of time so that we're not eating our lunch waiting for it to come up on and, the screen. And Mr. Chair, can I ask if there's anybody who is going to do that to let us know in advance so we can put it on the agenda? Right, right. And the agenda comes out basically the week before the meeting. So yeah, I think everybody's aware. Get it in. Yeah. All right, let's move on to something less <laughs> exciting. Board director's comments. Do you want to wait and just do them all at once and get to the informational items, Steve, or how do you want to proceed? Uh, yeah, let's yeah, let's do that. But uh, but I'm going to open up the informational items because, because as Ronnie's you see, not here. Ronnie Poole's not here and Brian Wagon's not here because we have a uh, we have an electrical outage out at the north end of the port and they've been uh, uh -huh. it, that happened last night okay. or, or late yesterday afternoon and they're working with a contractor out there. So uh, I kind of thought that was uh, uh, a more urgent place for them to be than sitting here with us. So I hope you don't mind that I. I made a command decision mm -hmm. at 17 minutes. and I didn't ask permission. Uh, but I but I will mention you know, a couple of things going on uh, in both of their areas there. I mean, everybody knows the ships are coming, the ships are going. So uh, and that hasn't stopped and there's nothing infrastructure wise that has prevented anybody from coming in. Uh, and uh, but we are we do have a contractor on the port now who is doing some crane rail repairs on the dock. The crane rails kind of pop loose in a couple of areas as the dock begins to show its age. So they're here now kind of reattaching it uh, so that it's not floating because as I understand it from the guys, you know, you can see when the crane is bumping over those those high spots and that's probably not something you want to see happen uh, too often. So that that work is uh, is underway right now. Uh, the other work that's going on on the dock, I think maybe John is in a better position because it's PA and P related. Uh, so I'll, uh, you can go ahead and, and uh, talk about that when it's your turn. But uh, but I did want to mention <laughs> <laughs> this is your meeting, but uh, go ahead. Charge in this part, right? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, and uh, the only other thing that we're you know we're doing is uh, getting ready to put in place. It goes to the uh, it goes to the assembly for approval. We have to purchase fuel to do the final testing of the petroleum lines to these to an API standard before we can actually or or before the petroleum users are actually going to commit to using them for real. So that paperwork has made its way to into the system to get put on the, uh, it's going to be an ITB, right? We have to act, we have to issue an ITB to do it. Uh, we tried to do it as a sole source from a couple of the petroleum users and uh, purchasing we shot us in the head. So we're going to go, so they said, no, you're going to do an ITB. So all that paperwork will hit the street and we'll let the users who volunteered the fuel know so that if they're interested in bidding on it, they can. And once that's done, then really there's nothing stopping uh, the petroleum guys from using the PCT. Uh, the dredging is now in the hands of Manson and uh, they're maintaining it at the new operating depth that we have for the PCT. So again, and the, plumbing, and the plumbing works and the lights work. So all we're waiting on now is to be able to, use, to, to get the petroleum plumbing part. Did you do the line flush yet? Steve? Well, that's what this is. What are you not doing with the water? No. The high, there was a hydrostatic test that was required uh, before PP, for PPM. Right, a pressure test. That was done. But that's not good enough. No, of course not. But and you need to push it with water to get all the rags and well, welding rods out of there. Well, push it with fuel into a, into a, a garbage tank. That's the plan. Ah. That's what, they, that's what these guys want. Okay. And that's what they're going to get. Yeah. So, uh, so that's that's what's coming. All right. And, and now I'll turn it over to John. <laughs> All right. Well, it's nice being here. I'm I'm just starting. I think this is my sixth week, so I survived yeah. a little over a month so far, and uh, um, it's pretty exciting to participate. And I 
glad I can work with Steve and hopefully take a little burden off of him. I know uh, he had a lot on his plate there. Um, what, what I've got going on, um, and this is all initiated by others, so I don't want to make it sound like I'm doing all this. I'm jumping into this stuff that's already working in process, but uh, the PCT is uh, getting ready to be closed out from the construction and turned over into operation. That includes uh, going through the final punch list of things, commissioning, uh, some reconciliation with the contractor in terms of their change orders and things like that. So uh, it's almost done. Uh, another month or so, we should be mostly done and ready to operate. Uh, there's a project uh, for the new uh, administration building that's going to be built right over here across the parking lot, and they're getting ready to break ground on that. They're going to um, start work on the foundations and put some uh, uh, construction offices over there, and that'll be ready in about um, somewhere around Christmas 2023. That should be uh, ready for uh, occupancy, and we'll move from here over there, then they can you know, demolish this facility. Um, the North Extension Stabilization Program uh, was out for a uh, qualification-based bid, a design-build bid uh, that was evaluated, and we're nearly complete with the selection of a contractor for that. It's still in the evaluation phase, so we can't talk about the details. I, other than to say there's uh, some discussions going on with legal things and, and uh, trying to select a contractor. Anticipating in another couple of weeks, I'll probably make the final selection and have a contractor on board. And that's to uh, demolish the or stabilize the, the north extension there. They're going to do some uh, ground improvements and remove some of those sheet piles. Um, and then the other piece uh, that I'm working on is the uh, selection for the designer. Well, it's to uh, review the preliminary design for the terminals that we've been talking about. That's being reviewed. There's an independent review of that, uh, trying to get that to a preliminary stage from the program manager. And then they're going to go out for RFP to select the actual designer. And that should go out sometime in October. The hope was they would have the designer on board sometime after the first of the year. So, and that's about all I can think of right now, but uh, Steve's got me buried over there and, meetings and other things. So. Well, John, let me ask you something real quick about the North stabilization or demolition, um, because the fact that you intermingled those two terms, it rose, made me wonder, uh, because if you start dragging sheet pile out of there, there was a lot of material added, and we have an issue with material moving around the face of the docks and not getting the depth that we're looking for. What's to keep that from floating out into the front of the docks if you just pull the sheet pile out. I mean, what, yeah, what so you... they have a pretty good plan uh, and it has partially to do with um, it, it, this was required in the RFP documents, but it has to do with the permitting. So they can't permit the in water work until two years from now. So this next summer they would do deep soil mixing in the uplands so they're not removing any water side stuff this next summer and they stabilize this area behind the wall with this cement basically they inject cement and mix it up with the soil so it's and they put some armor rock in there so that's all next summer then the following summer they come in and they're required to have a pretty detailed demo and disposal plan and it's it's a little challenging because there's a stability issue uh, there's a safety issue if they don't do it correctly it could collapse and and so there's the, the contractors are re required to provide a plan and to include engineering and stabilization in that plan. And the, the proposers all did that and they're reasonably well done. So they've thought about that in a fair amount of detail. And that was a key element of it. But at the, at the 50,000 foot level, the fill comes out before the sheet power is pulled. That's how you prevent, I think, what you're concerned about happening. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the sequence, am I wrong? Right. And they have to do it in steps, yeah. so it's never unbalanced. There's never too much of a cliff, if you will, of, of uh, material. <laughs> There's also a phase where they can do some of it from the uplands with a crane or heavy earthwork equipment. But once they get down near the water line, they do it from the water side with a derrick barge. That limits the 
risk to the workers of Thank you. Just a question. Um, I know we've got a new office building and construct across the way. Uh, that's all I know. For nine million dollars, what do you get? A new office building across the way. <laughs> right. How many square feet is it going in there? Is it just the office for the administration of the board, or it's, is it it's, uh, more? Or it's three levels. It's, it's three similar to this. There's uh, parking at the lower level. Uh -huh. There's the offices on the second level, and actually, this conference room will move to the third level uh, with some uh, peripheral support office space and storage space up there. Once you know, once we get approval of the 65% design, I'm happy to share the drawings with you. Okay, just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Will there be a, a deck like? Yeah, there'll be here? and there'll be a walkout on the third level. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Great. So Cheryl, we got any money? Time <laughs> in. <laughs> So just to uh, save some time, I, I trust that each one of you studied this uh, to, and committed it to memory. <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. But, oh, you have it on the board. Okay. Well, uh, and How are we supposed to see that, Jim? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. You can't even see that. Uh, oh, yes, you can. Can you see the scan button? Yeah. yeah. We don't need to see everybody else. Right. So Stuff supposed to don't show off. You're the only one to give it in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wrong, wrong, wrong monitor, sorry. Yeah, just close that and see what it does for uh, a little bit of. Yeah, that's a little bit. I, I think that may be what I can do. Okay. No, it's a little better. I can read it now. So, uh, for as far as our revenue goes, we're uh, on track for this year. We we don't see any points of concern over not meeting our uh, projected revenue, fifteen million dollars. Um, so, as of August, we've already collected eleven point nine, so nearly twelve million dollars with uh, four months left to go. Um, so, we're uh, five months actually. Yeah, September. Yeah, you can yeah, so we're, we're in pretty good shape as far as that goes. We're still, you know, working through uh, our personnel services are a little bit below where uh, the 67% of the projected just due to vacancies and, you know, Sharon left at the end of February uh, or, yeah, the end of February and we had some vacancy there. So those wages not being paid, you know, they'll, that'll put us under for the year. Uh, nothing really exciting. Non labor is all about you know the summertime work and some of the projects coming in and being invoiced. So we, uh, Steve and I, do really anticipate that to uh, be uh, just enough under budget to uh, make us happy. Uh, legal services, not much uh, there. We're just paying those bills as Bob sends them in, and uh, the me said the dividend payments are paid on schedule making our debt service payments, which we had anticipated. And uh, I added uh, the cash balance so we could see, so everyone would know at, on a snapshot at 831, the port's cash balance was almost $18 million. And, those, and so for your information, you know, that money does include grant reimbursements that we will receive. Um, so where you see $3 million is what we have available. This is just your port operating. The $17 million will include some construction cash. So that may, but but it really is still port money. So is it money. cash or is it? Hmm? No, it's cash. Well, it's. It's not really cash though. Well, it's, Ross has it invested, right? It's cash. It's it cash. is cash. So it's cash we have if we needed it. It's, yeah. Okay. Cash. I just was. Okay. It's, it's, actual cash it's, it's not, not reimbursement. It's not accounting stuff. Yeah. 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 All right, so we need your passport, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and everything else is for informational purposes. One of the interesting things that came up, Steve received a, the uh, metrics on the Ship Creek boat launch. Yeah. And so we lined that up against our boat launch fees, and we, and we were pleasantly surprised that pretty much everybody that launched and was counted 
paid their fee. <laughs> It is an honor system, okay. right? So Steve had someone track, and uh, yeah, so we're within, I think, twenty dollars. Voters are honorable guests. Yeah. Wow. So that's an interesting. Twelve hundred bucks. Wow. Yeah. yeah right. Barely, yeah. Now that now you need to get his passport. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. All right, and the second page is your tonnage uh, comparison year over year as of August thirty first, and then year to date. Uh, just to see where we're at as far as hitting the target uh, for last year, 4.9 million last year, and 3.4 so far this year, with four months to go. Okay, so that's in, so the top one is the 12 month rolling, and then the bottom one is your two. Yeah. two okay, good. The top one is is every August. Yep. Thank you for doing that. Yep, anytime. It makes it looks it looks real good. Mm-hmm. I like the colors too. You know, more colors. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep that. Uh, uh, the port's audited financial statements are posted on the website for 2021. We completed that, and Jim has the audit posted. So if you're interested in uh, reading their work, um, it was uh, it's there for your reading enjoyment. Got trouble getting to sleep. Today. Yep. Yeah. Any questions for Cheryl on the financial report? Hearing none, Jim, you're on the bubble. I will keep my report short and sweet. Uh, we're starting to get into um, harvest season for grants. Uh, we discovered we did not get an in for grants. Uh, we are waiting on most of our other DOC grants. I will be surprised if we hear about them before mid-October, um, and I would actually anticipate November because right now the grant reviewers have, I heard, at 1.7 times the normal number of grants they're reviewing because of the additional money. Um, so I would, I think we're probably waiting on that. Uh, on the good news side, we did get $5.3 million for our core power plan last week from uh, the Defense Communities Infrastructure Program. So uh, that is basically the, the kickoff for our port power plan and the, um, the port microgrid for power resilience. And that will start construction probably in April, May. Congrats. Excellent. Any questions for Jim? We've been through public comments. Um, port directors closing. Are you done? My, my opening and closing. Yes. Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll be brief. I, you know, I was going to uh, I was going to launch into my oratory regarding you know not the surcharge because somebody's going to tell me what to do there, and my opinion hasn't mattered yet. I can't imagine it's going to start to matter at all. Um, but with respect to the doc design and the design advisory board, we sent. Uh, last night at the uh, at the port at the port commission at the assembly at the assembly meeting, we had two items on the agenda. We had uh, to enter for public hearing the uh, the lease, the proposed lease arrangement between the port and a company called Vertical Bridge, that's going to put a 150 foot cell tower uh, up on the track J area there uh, at the top of the hill. Uh, so that has to go to public comment because it's a lease arrangement. So it's going to be on their uh, the assembly's agenda for October 11th. Uh, we've talked to the good folks at Vertical Bridge. You know, there are some antenna that belong to us that are on this building that shouldn't be there when the wrecking ball swings. And they have agreed to give us space at no cost on that tower so we can move those things that are for import, you know, port requirements uh, to uh, give a new home. Uh, and take some of that pressure off of what's going to go on the roof of the new building. There'll still be some, but there won't hopefully not need to be as many as there as we have on the roof here now. The other item on the agenda was for the assembly to approve what the design advisory board recommended with respect to the cargo dock and direction given to Jacobs to go forward with uh, some additional what ifs, we, you know, do we make, you know, what's it going to cost to make the dock as wide, terminal two as wide as terminal one? Notice I'm not calling them Matson's birth and Toad's birth. I'm going to call them terminal one and terminal two. And I would invite all of you to adopt that vernacular. You know, 
And uh, so we've got that and running crane rail. Do we run crane rail the whole way or do we not? So they're costing all of that out. Uh, and uh, that was all in what we wanted the assembly to give us permission to move ahead with. And they, what they voted to do instead was postpone that until uh, the October 28th uh, assembly meeting. But have us have you know David, David Ames and Jacobs and John and I go to an enterprise utility oversight committee meeting and give them more detail on that than what they had in their in their packages to vote. So jury's still out on the design. Uh, we thought half of it was in the can and half of it's not in the can yet. Um, and uh, what the you know what the process going forward is going to be with respect to uh, do we just wait now and send them the whole cargo dock enchilada at once, or do we still try to do it you know the way we phase to do it now? More to come on that. I suspect that will come out of that meeting. But you know, I, I guess my advice to you is you know if we're waiting to make this third charge decision till we have perfect information, the day will never come. So at some point, it's going to be Fisher Cup big time for y'all. So just be, be prepared for that. And the other thing I wanted to mention was with respect to the Ship Creek boat launch. Well, while that's interesting news, I wish the expenses to maintain that place were covered <laughs> by the fees. Going to be a public and servant. They, like yeah, and they never will. Well, here's, you know, here's my bright idea, and I may get laughed out of an assembly meeting um, when I do it, but I've asked for this information because I'm going to propose to the to the assembly to take the boat launch off the ports plate. It it could find a better home in parks and recreation. Oh okay. yeah. In that department. That's a better home for it. In that instance, they can issue the, the assembly can issue geo bonds for the maintenance and repair. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't see putting the burden on the port users to cover the costs of a boat launch that they get absolutely no value out of. Unless they launch a boat there and I don't know it. <laughs> Unless they're sick netters and I don't know it. You know, and, and the community that uses it will never be big enough to cover the six, seven, eight million dollars worth of repairs that have to be done down there. If you really want to put it back into shape, it's it's an absurd it's an absurd obligation to foist on this group who really gets no use of it. So if it ever sees the light of day in an assembly meeting, I invite you all to, to help to help sell that help sell that cost. And and because this is unlike unlike the rest of the port, which it would be unfair to put a geo bond on on the Anchorage taxpayers. To cover the cost of because it has statewide value. This boat launch does not have statewide value. It's a local group. Give so, it life. Yeah, it's a life. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. So anyway, uh, I'm trying to put the I'm trying to put enough good information together so I can make that proposal to the. Uh, yeah, to none the of the none of the city parks have statewide value. None of this infrastructure has statewide value. It's just yeah. yeah. So. Would a letter from the commission help you? In that I, th endeavor? I think I think it would. Uh, the time's not right, but I will certainly let you know when the time is right. Or you may find some a, a letter from the commission to the assembly show up on an agenda. Uh, if uh, if this train starts moving faster, then I think it will. Okay. But but I but I've got that on my to do list. The other thing I have to do list, and that's the only point back to what we've talked about surcharge wise here, is. I think it's time, and I've, I've had some conversations with some of the assembly members who really don't understand what it means to be an unregulated utility. Says, and to have the conversation with them is, why, why don't we fund appreciation? Why don't we adjust the rates so that our great grandchildren who are gonna be sitting around this table in 70 years don't have to look at each other and go, how the hell are we going to pay for this? Because we have established and put in place the mechanisms to put that money in the bank so that, in fact, when the facility is depreciated, you've got what it takes to get the ball rolling, if not cover the entire cost 
of what it is you've got to do next. I think it's time to grow up, you know, and uh, and that might be an easier sell than the damn boat launch. But uh, but I think that's a, another conversation worth having. Will that mean a rate adjustment? Uh huh. Will it mean potentially less less work for Ross in the future? At least with respect to the port, it might. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but uh, but I've been chewing on that one for a couple of years now, and the timing just hasn't been right, but now it is. So uh, so anyway, that's what I wanted to share today. That's a very important point, and I think it's something that's been brought up by commissioners in the past, obviously. I wonder how we got here. Um, thanks, Steve. Any questions for Steve from the commission? Okay, so around the horn, um, Abe's, do you have any comments you'd like to make in closing? I think we made uh, had a good discussion today. We heard some information that we hadn't heard before. And I believe that uh, we're we are getting very close to making a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Is Peggy. Kevin Mackey's on the line as well. Oh, you know, okay. Yeah. And but Scott Seltzer is not. He was not able to make it. Yeah. Uh, Chris. So, a couple of comments. I like, want to voice some disappointment the fact that we're breaking ground on that in office and not breaking on the dock first. Atco buildings are, are perfectly acceptable to work out of until we complete the dock. We got a dock that's ready to fall apart. Longshoremen working on it. I work out on the truck. I think we got a lot of good information today. Still want to know what the cost of the container is for both companies. But uh, that's where I'm at. Thank you, Chris. Kevin. You're muted. There you go. You guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Perfect. Uh, no comment other than I'm glad we're waiting to make a decision. That was a lot of information that was brought forward and then got to parse through quite a bit. So other than that, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Wow. Uh, oh. Um, good meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming in, guys. That was very helpful. Um, follow up for maybe next meeting was uh, last time Ron and I asked for the port to do uh, to take a look at a terminal manual. Just if we can get an update on where that stands, that is important for the operating the port. And, and I, I, that. I can give you one right now. If you want. So we got the copy of okay. him from uh, I saw these all and, and the one from Nikiski yeah. KPL. Yeah. So I haven't seen the Nikiski ones, but I do have well, some. Ronnie, Ronnie that got that, that before I yeah, came okay. up with I will have to track something. that down. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to work on that. OK, yeah. Perfect. Well, we got probably another nine months before the PCT starts rolling anyway, so we can <laughs> put it in place then. Right? That's all. Thank you. All right, here. Ah, congratulations, Jim, on getting those grants and continuing with uh, move uh, efforts forward to get more grants. So uh, we'll watch with great interest. That's it. Mike? You know, um, I was just wondering, is there a, somebody mentioned to me, I knew somebody who was a port commissioner a while back, and they said they got some kind of a notebook that had like, uh, do we have bylaws? Or that's that's procedures? in the works. That is in, in the works. works. Yeah, okay. I brought it in and Kathleen yeah. copied it. Now we have to update. I got mine in 2000. 10 or something so it has to be updated with the new tariff the latest code but it is happening i believe that well and and i'm going to be honest here's the stutter i have never seen that right ever and how you got it or how I mean, anybody you got were, it you were assistant port director back then I'm, yeah that's that, that's you know. true but i don't know who was in charge of farming there wasn't one next to new commissioners season. because i so I'm so Mike, right. I'm glad it's in the works. I really appreciate that. <laughs> this, I don't need to have a discussion yeah. about it. Yeah. I just want to see the book. I want my, I want the information so that I, can I apologize manage and do my job as a commissioner today. properly. That's no. my point. Is yeah. that we all need yeah. to have the information so that we can operate properly. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I'm looking for. I want to do the right we job. You just need to buy seven inch binders. I'll buy ten inch binders. I'll buy them for everybody if you'll get the data. <laughs> okay. We just got to update it, I guess. This, uh, yeah. Kathleen wasn't real happy about that. Uh, did I miss any commissioners? I didn't think so. We did Aves. And I just like to reiterate, thank you very much, uh, both Tone and Madison, for making the time to come in and presenting us with this information. I look forward to 
Any further information you'd like to present prior to the next meeting, I encourage you to come up with this location of information. And I would just encourage all commissioners to take some time to go over this because we can't put this off forever. It's going to come down to a vote next meeting if I have anything to say about it. Um, speaking of that, let's move to the meeting schedule. The next meeting. That's what we're signing right now. I only. I, I can get it done before Thanksgiving. It's got well October. We're going to do October, October, and it's got a. I can tell you if it's going to be a Wednesday, I could go the fifth or I can go the twenty sixth. Otherwise, I'm busy. We can't really have me without you, so it's going well, we sure can. Days, Garrett so. does a fine job, but um, <laughs> he'll probably be in Hawaii anyway. No, I won't. <laughs> I'm postponing my travel uh, just before you, Ron. Just just for the meeting, <laughs> yeah, right. You're looking at the end of October. Right? The fifth or the twenty, 20 you know, the fifth is, is it's ridiculous. Next it's next yeah, week. Twenty six. Yeah, yeah. Twenty six is is what I would. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. It's 26. I'll let you know right now. I will not be here, nor will I be in a place where I can phone in. So I'll be turning it over to a suitable substitute. I also is that going to work with the assembly could schedule? You the 20, huh? Could you do it the 24th? You can't. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, Wednesday, I'm not here. It well, it doesn't have to be Wednesday, does it? No. No. But I'm out that whole week. Oh, you are? Um, yeah, I'm out that whole week. All right. So what's uh, the Monday's better for you? Um, Ross? Yeah, I could do yeah, I, I, on, on about the honor about the tw on about the 26th. I'm leaving. I'm off the grid for a couple weeks. How about the 25th then? Well, the 31st is a Monday. Mm -hmm. I can't do the 25th. Be 31st, 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 I'm, I'm gone. Oh. I'm flying to Poland. 24th was so wow. 20, October 24 is a Monday. October 21 is a Friday. That would work for me the 21st. Yeah, and, and, and the, port, the port has its budget meeting with the assembly on the 21st. Schedule. Look at my schedule. What's wrong with the 25th, Ross? I know Wednesdays. Are uh, we could probably, could pro well, there's an assembly meeting on the 25th, but. Oh, you know, uh, let's do it the, the 24th then. Anybody have an issue with the 24th? Monday? That's yeah. Monday. I'm not going to have my teeth brushed. My hair is going to be no, sleep I'm on the top. Just, I'm going to my calendar. Yeah, no problem. My own just wear your heart hat. We don't care. Yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know know have a mayor's commission meeting that day or not. So I don't can you, know, can you call in think. maybe on the I team? I can maybe call in. That would be fine. Okay. As long as we're going to need a quorum. Abe's, Kevin, 21st? Uh, 24th. I can do the 24th by teams. Uh, the 21st be better for people. I thought you said you couldn't do the 21st. No, we have to. I can't. I can. Yeah, we have our budget meetings with the assembly on Friday the 21st. All right, so let's just stick with the 24th because I'm flying back from Kodiak the 20th. I don't want to take okay. a chance. Um, it sounds like that's the closest one. 24th would, would work for me. I'll have to call them. 24th. Yeah. Noon. Okay. I'm good with the 24th. 24 works for me. Thanks, guys. That would be. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Any opposed? Hearing none. We'll see you next time. Yeah. All right. I mean, we're, we're all over the place. There's, there's nothing we can do about that. But if we have the information and we do a little bit of homework ahead of time.